Welcome back, everybody. This is Doc Talks News and Views. I'm Deborah. And I'm Katrina. And today we're visiting with Brad Smith. Smith. <laughs> Brad Smith. It's a difficult <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a brain cramp. I'm glad I didn't call you Brad Jones. Anyway, <laughs> Brad Smith, who is with the American Chestnut Tree Foundation. And we're going to have a conversation about our American chestnut trees, why they're important, and why we should care about them. Um, so to me, I, I actually, you know, I think it's a good time to talk about the chestnut tree, not, not only for the whole science behind it and the conversations we'll get in today, but also it's fall, right, Katrina? I mean, oh, I think yeah. people think of trees a lot in the fall as they're, they're turning and we start thinking about our evergreens. It's leaf peeping season. And it is leaf, leaf peeping it. season. So um, today, Brad will tell us all about the American chestnut tree. So let's start with, I know this is a radio show, but maybe there's a way we can describe what a chestnut tree looks like. Where could somebody yeah. in North Burst see one? Well, that's, that's the first thing. You have to know what it is, and there aren't that many around. So a lot of people get confused with the horse chestnut, which puts out these fairly big round brown nuts and comes in almost uh, a casing that looks like a land like an ancient World War II landmine but the the American chestnut is different it's really a cross between a beech and an oak and they're actually all in the same family oak beech chestnut there's one other are all in the fagaceae family so there is there's some similarities and they're even e it's even hard if you know what you're looking for there's some chest there's some uh, like chestnut oak looks a lot like chestnut, but it's an oak. And there's uh, like a Siberian elm looks like a chestnut. And, and, a, and then of course there are different varieties of chestnut. But if you imagine anywhere you see an oak tree now or an oak forest, 100 years ago, well, 120 years ago, the American chestnut tree would outcompete the oak and would, would basically be the major hardwood in the forest. Wow. Hmm. So, and if you look around our forests, they're mostly oak. So you think of anywhere you see an oak stand, that was probably a chestnut stand. So what happened 120 yeah. years ago? What well, happened to all of our What happened chestnuts? is we humans like to travel around the world and we spread things and we're, you know, experiencing that right now. Uh, somehow a bark fungus traveled from either Japan or China on nursery stock sent over to you know homes were trying to improve their plantings in the 19th century and then that it's a fungus it's a it's a spore like a mold spore okay. once that spore got into the United States it just started spreading but it was probably introduced in the 1880s it wasn't really like officially noticed until uh, 1901 in New York Botanical Garden they had a bunch of big chestnut trees, and all of a sudden people realized they were getting like these wounds, these cankers, and they were dying. And people, what is this? And they started, you know, trying to, they tried to t take samples and try to figure out what it was. And they did find out that it was a, it was a fungus, a bark fungus, and they gave it a name, Cryphonectria parasitica. And uh, they started to try to figure out how can we fight this. And they ended up realizing it's nearly impossible to fight. Mm. Wow. Because it's a mold spore. It gets just, it travels in the air and it, it lives in other trees. Like it lives on hickory trees, but it doesn't kill them. It lives on other trees, but it doesn't kill them. That's what, you don't, don't want to be too successful a parasite or else you have no place to live. Right. Like if there were only chestnut trees, the parasite would be in trouble. But there are other places it can live. So uh, within about 50 years, pretty much every mature and small American chestnut tree got a, got a canker, a sore on their bark, girdles the tree, nothing goes, nothing, no nutrients go up to the tree, wow. and killed off every single chestnut tree, about, was it 400 million, I, I, billion, 400 billion, I think, trees basically got killed off in about 50 years. Wow. All, all the way up and down the Appalachian, all the eastern forest. That is so sad. And, and you think about that happened, you know, over the course of a few years, 120 yep. years ago, and today we're fighting that lantern fly. And oh, there's always something there's coming. There's always something. And we, we have more. <laughs> it's not just chestnut blight. There's another thing I might get into later, which is um, the reason you don't see a lot of chestnuts on the closer to the water is 
there's something called ink disease, which actually attacked the roots. And that's really bad, because then the tree dies. At least with chestnut blight, the tree tends to keep re-sprouting from the root collar. So it's but trying. It's trying. But there's another thing called um, uh, cryphonectria. No, no, yes. No, yes, excuse me. No, it's a uh, thiatophthora cinnamimi, which is a fungus that a root disease that goes into the roots and totally kills the tree and that actually happens more in warmer climates like you know in the south but it's sort of creeping its way up way so up. as our climate mm -hmm. changes. As, yes as i mean the climate is yeah as climate changes and as it just seems to be moving forward hope so far we don't see it as much here but that means we're really trying to get a blight resistant tree as well as a root rot resistant tree and there are other things that want to kill chestnut like this there's chestnut weevils although those are pretty good they they don't do too much they just go into a few nuts and and burrow in and uh, make their little larvae and then they grow in the ground and they <laughs> do that to the but that doesn't kill the tree that doesn't kill and the there's tree. also chestnut gall wasp which can get in and make make the next branch not grow but so you mentioned that the chestnuts are part of those large tree groups, our beech, yep. our oak, yep. and um, chestnuts. Yep. Yeah, so but mainly beech, oak. So I'm, I'm trying to think I'm leaving. Beech, oak, like, and chestnuts. I feel like I'm leaving one out, but I know. Yeah. But we want these large trees in our forests. Why? We do. It's okay, what, 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 are their, what do these trees do for it's, us? It's a more diverse ecosystem, right? You don't want uh, monoculture in any any kind of system. So the chestnut had a, a huge niche in the, in the environment, and it was important for people and very important for animals, too, not to mention right. it sort of just changed the whole look and feel of the forest. So, I mean, it's, it's said that uh, a, ch a squirrel could have, get on, could have gotten on a chestnut tree in Maine and made it all the way down to Mississippi just by hopping from treetop to treetop. They were so... It, it they were that some, prolific. Yeah, no, now. it made up somewhere like 25% of all the trees in the east, which mm. is huge. And, and our sudden, forests now yeah. are mostly oak, so bringing the chestnut back would bring yeah. back that diversity. Yes. And Not there's anything wrong healthier. with oak, but it's 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 always nice to have more species right. in the forest. Mm. And an overall healthier. Yeah, and um, of course, the uh, one thing about an oak is that it does make it does make nuts, but there you got to eat them really carefully or you have to treat humans have to treat them and boil them and do all sorts of things which native americans did but the chestnut is like ready to go right when it drops a bear can eat it a, a blue jay can eat it a human can eat it it's and each you don't think about it but each tree produces like 400 pounds of mass or mass sorry that's the name for the nut crop every year and that and these things last you know 400 years so that's a ton of food going out into the mammals and the birds and humans wow hmm. in fact i kind of noticed i've done a little study on I, you don't think about it but you know we were climate change has been around for a while we were we had the last ice age the last glaciation was yeah. like a thousand a chestnut came back it, it hit out down in florida the florida panhandle and alabama it went all retreated all the way down to there that's when the ice sheet was all the way down to long island and then over you know between fourteen thousand and a thousand it's fairly late comer thousand years before present it, everything moved back up and the chestnut moved back up almost the same time as humans the the uh, the uh, northeast indians came back up almost following the chestnut i don't know if it has, there's any relationship but if you look at the pollen record and you look at the human ar ar the uh, archaeological record it's almost the exact same thing chestnut's very kind of new in a way huh but it's a, a food source for animals oh, and yeah. humans, so yeah. that's no, why it, it makes sense. sense that it was easier yeah. to live in the northeast with the chestnut around than not. Than not. Wow. And it's funny because even they they found some fish weirs, you know, where they put poles in the right. and the, and then I was really excited because I thought, oh, these fish weirs, they have to use chestnut poles. But then I realized it was like thirteen thousand before present, and chestnut really wasn't up yet. But you know, I'm sure if they had found one that was later, it would have been. So it's it it's a uh, yeah, out at Harvard Forest, they actually found a, bo a bog where they took meticulous records of the pollen, and they could pretty much figure out every f 50 to 100 years what the different tree species were because of the way the, the pollen got preserved in the, in the record. So it sounds crazy, but they can pretty much tell when the tree came back just from one bog. Wow. The pollen from 
That's Other pretty medium. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so because we've lost all our chestnut trees, the American Chestnut Foundation was formed to help fix this. Yes, and again, it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a weird thing. We've, uh, they're sort of functionally extinct. So they, they're still around, but they do not proliferate. They, heart, they usually die right after they're ready to you know, make the next generation. So I don't think they're even considered like a endangered tree, even though they should be, because they, they keep dying off and they can't do what they used to do. But uh, anyway, so yes, people, people obviously wanted to keep the tree. It is a huge, I mean, I haven't even gotten into the huge cultural tradition it was for, you know, in the United States after settlers came. But I mean, there was a whole chestnut culture. In Europe, there's a whole chestnut culture, which most of us don't know anything about because mm -hmm. we haven't, you know, we're not 120 years old. So, you know, the, people used to know what it was to go chestnutting. Like you'd go out in the fall and you'd collect nuts because it was just a, you know, a fun thing, to do. thing to do. And kids in the South used to go chestnutting and bring the nuts into the cities and get money for them. It was like, you know, it was, uh, they would, it was called shoe money. They'd buy like their, their fall, their school shoes because they could bring chestnuts in from the forest and get money for them. So, and it's also the way farmers uh, fattened up their hogs in the fall. They'd let them mm. go out into the woods and fatten up on chestnuts. And they, then of course they'd drive them into the cities for slaughter and make money on them. So just so, a lot of little things we don't right. even think about anymore. So today, bringing back the chestnuts into our forests, not only for the beauty that we mentioned, because they are a, a huge tree. I mean, yep. everybody knows what an oak looks like, but they have, ec um, they had historic economic significance oh, yeah. and they would, they would probably bring, have economic um, yes, impact it, yes, too it, yeah, in lumber, today's world. Lumber companies would be very interested because they're a fast growing hardwood, which is unusual. And they're also have really high strength to weight ratio. So, and they're also very naturally rot resistant. So it's got like ah. the trifecta of lumber. If you really, if you really want those, you know, that's what you want. You want something that grows fast, it's a hardwood and it doesn't rot. And that's why chestnuts were used for building materials, main beams, I'm sure, you know, there are thousands of them in the houses right here in Northboro. The main beams are chestnut. The, uh, they also use fence rails. It was great for fence rails. It was great. They made, uh, they made shakes for the, the roof. They made siding for the side, side of the house. They used it for furniture. It's easy to work. So it's, it, was a, it was a big deal as far as lumber goes. So we want them back for all of these yeah, well, reasons. Well, yeah, we want, we want so them back. So what are we doing? Well, How are we well, trying to combat this, this spore that's probably so tiny? It's prob is it invisible to the yeah, naked it's just, eye? It's, it's like just a mold spore, which I don't know what the exact yeah, size is. Tiny, but it, you tiny. can't see it, basically. And it's airborne. So what happened so was... So what are we doing? Well, at first, when, when people realized, scientists realized that, the, you know, that this this chestnut blight was kind of, you can see, you know, 1910, it's already, you know, into Pennsylvania and Connecticut in 1920, it's down, you know, it just, it expanded until it's basically the whole eastern seaboard. So the government tried to do something about it. I think it was the United States Department of Agriculture back then tried to uh, say, you know, we have to do something about this. So they actually tried to do hybrids, but they didn't really do it very scientifically. They would just try, people sort of knew that Chinese trees seemed to be, uh, resistant to the blight and Americans didn't and they usually did some cross breeding and then they would plant the trees out and they wouldn't do so well. They really didn't take it sort of to the next step that they needed to. So during the 30s they tried to do a lot of cross breeding and then places like Pennsylvania they they did amazing things like they tried to cut two acre swaths in the forest to try to keep the blight uh -huh. from moving. They buried trees in the ground. They poured foam on trees didn't work right <laughs> so basically so people sort of started giving up around the 40s and then of course you know had wars and things and people just sort of had given up on the chestnut ever coming back and then it was some some interesting people i've met some of them who somewhere out it's weird out in minnesota there was a little group that started getting interested in bringing the tree back uh, some trees that went across the mississippi went far enough west could grow pretty well and not get the blight. So they sort of, there were there are some stands, there's actually a stand of real chestnut out in Wisconsin, believe it or not, which mm. is because oh, a farmer wow. brought, in 1880, a farmer brought eight nuts out with them. It started eight trees and that started a whole forest. But uh, anyway, the people out there in the, it's the early 80s, uh, decided there's gotta be something we can do. And 
a guy named Phil Rudder started something called the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh-huh. And he, he got in touch with a, a corn breeder who was a scientist named Charles Burnham. And he, being a corn geneticist, he knew that, you know, you, and if you remember biology, Mendel, if you have, you know, peas that are white and peas that are blue and you, you know, cross them, you'll get half white, half, you know, everyone sort of knows that. He knew through corn that there's really no reason you shouldn't be able to get the blight resistance of the Chinese tree into the American and keep mostly American uh, traits. So that's called back crossing. And that's what we have been doing until about two years ago. We, we've done, it was called the uh, back cross method, and we figured that eight generations would get back, would get a tree that was, you know, like 96% American, but would still have the Chinese blight resistance. So, but, you know, it sounds easy to talk about, but a generation is planting, you know, 300 trees, letting them grow up, inoculating them twice with two different types of blight, culling out the ones that die, and just taking the, the ones that survive and then doing the next step, and that's every eight to 10 years. So it's, it's, it's a long, it's a, long it's a pain in the butt. I know having, <laughs> been, <laughs> having been part of just part of this process, it's, you know, it's, it's not that easy. And a number of trees are going to die because oh, they're blight resistant. Well, I was an orchard so, manager, yeah. and the thing is you plant 300 trees, and you're lucky to come out with two or three by the end, oh, wow. which can be, de- can be very depressing and From doesn't make... From 300 trees? Doesn't make, well, that's, it's really... Um, wow. For every 100 trees, it was something like uh, two to six of them would be what we would want. In other words, they were just, it's just, you right. know, shaking the dice. It was, those are the ones that were going to get the genes that we were trying to carry through. Right. But again, it takes so a long time. So then you start all over, and then, then it's you another take those eight nuts, to 10 and then you, years. yeah, then you, and you cross those with another poly. It, it's very. This is very patient work. Well, and also, we in the Massachusetts chapter, which started, I think, about, how was it, 2000? It was like somewhere in 1999, 2000, somewhere around there. We, yeah, we just had our 20th something anniversary. Well, anyway, so the local chapter, uh, if we find a really nice chestnut tree, we go up into it. We, you know, I can't I think we have any in Northboro. We have, we have these mother, we call them mother trees. Those are the trees that we've, we've actually tried to capture the genetics. Capturing the genetics means you have to visit the tree at the exact right time mm-hmm. in the spring when the flowers, which uh, you can see on my little, the flowers are like uh, big, long, well, they used to be pipe cleaners, but no one knows what those are. They're called catkins. They're just big, big yellow flowers. You have to go up before the flowers start, and you have to bag a little, you have to bag a little section of where you see there's going to be a nut or a burr, and then you have to go back, and this is all on bucket truck mostly, by the way. Then you wow. go back with your pollen that you got sent from Virginia because they've already they're already three generations ahead, so you get to skip three generations ahead. You go up and you're brushing you're brushing the pollen on the end of the little. They're much at this point. They're only you know, the flowers are about as big as my pinky, and you're brushing the pollen on from up and up and in you know, a bucket 80 feet, truck. Yeah, eighty feet up in the air. It's amazing that the uh, we had a. One of our one of our board members was the chief forester at Mass Electric, so he was really good at getting us bucket trucks. I'm not sure how. <laughs> now they would just let us use them, which, which was which was very nice because if you know we hadn't had that, you can only do a few that you can reach. Well, down that you low. could reach, right? So. Anyway, so then so you so and you have to bag it. You put in like a lunch bag because you don't want other pollen getting in now because you put the right pollen in. So then you have to put a lunch bag on it. Actually, you already had to put a lunch bag on it, so just to make sure no other pollen got in. Then you have to visit a third time in the fall, harvest, you get it off, and then you get your nut, and you know you have the, the pollen you think. You know the, you know the parent, you know, you know the father, which is the pollen. The pollen is like 15 microns across. You can't see it. You're just brushing stuff on. You're just praying that it's going to work, and uh, amazingly, it works. It works. It works. Hmm. Yeah, That's no. great. And so now where are we planting these nuts? I think... So then, yeah, in the old plan, then all those nuts went into... Um, well, I guess a, a breeding orchard, back cross orchard. We're we're changing everything. In the last two years, our whole science plan has had to change because genetics has caught up oh, so much. Oh, we will much. talk about that. Yeah, we have yeah. to talk about that because what we used to think, the Charles Burnham plan, the corn geneticist, the assumption was that three genes would uh, confer blight resistance. Three genes is six alleles, two on each gene. And, you know, you're 
your trees are going to get either five out of six or six out of six. We figured those would be pretty good. You know, if they get two out of six, they're not going to do so well. But that was, we were willing because in a group of nuts, you'd get, you know, a bunch of them would be pretty good. Uh, as it turns out, it's not three genes. It's more like nine plus. Ah. So now, kind of coming to the conclusion that if we kept just trying to do what we were doing, actually, we were so successful, we ended up making the trees slightly less resistant. We made them so American by back crossing them to Americans mm. that we realized that some of the, we didn't really know where some of the uh, Chinese light resistant traits were on the gene. And so we actually have to go almost go backwards a little bit and then go forwards. So okay. it's, so we're, it's not all is lost and, and not to mention we've captured all this germplasm. Like we have, you know, trees from tops fields from, from the Cape, from Rentham. We have tre trees from all, all around. And those trees are still, most of those trees that we go to die the next year because people notice, oh, there's a huge chestnut tree in this development because mm. they get, you have a clear cut and then all of a sudden a tree takes off because it gets light and then people notice it and then it basically dies in a year because that's what the blood. pretty much exactly what happens. So, so we have, we actually already have really captured a lot of really good trees that are no longer with us in there. They're in the system, quote unquote. Like I, I personally have done, I did one in Topsfield. I did one down in Medway. Oh, I did one in Quabbin. I did a 50-foot oh, okay. one in Quabbin, which, uh, which was pretty amazing. So right up, I could actually see the reservoir from up in my, you from know, up in your 50, bucket. 60 feet up. <laughs> just amateur, just, you know, trying to pollinate. And it actually, it worked. And um, unfortunately, that tree died uh, like a truck. Uh, a skitter truck like nicked it or something and killed oh. it but but in general those type of trees they, they actually, wouldn't have lasted they anyway. don't last much right. they don't last very long so you've planted these nuts in a specific place right now yeah we have orchards we have they were used to call, be called back cross orchards there uh -huh. was uh, one at tower hill for around here uh, right now if you want to see more chestnuts you can go to westboro over at the mass fish and wildlife building okay you know the new building that has like a fancy trout pond in the middle of it now you, you no, should just go I'm look at the really sure. you should, you should so go look at let's tell our listeners it's, it's on how 135 okay. and uh it's uh, this like that little. Uh, I'm trying to even think. It's it's up behind some of the old uh, Westboro State Hospital okay. buildings. But it's um, yeah. What's the name? There's a big company up there. Oh, there's a little like access road. There's yeah. like a little development. So everybody right, on Lawton's South Way or South whatever. Street uh, becomes Milk Street. There's a little. Way it's to actually get up even. There. I think it's even further up. You go you go down and. Is it called Lawton's Way or something? There's like a little mm -hmm. development, and it's the next left. It's after the that. next left after that. And you that, go up yep. the hill, and it's and it should say Mass Fish and Wildlife. Right. I think there's a sign there. So mm -hmm. that's their headquarters. And behind the maintenance building, you'll see this weird fenced-off, deer-fenced area. And if you want it, you can see we're trying to grow about 2,000 trees there right now. That's and amazing. And they're so and all from seed. And they're doing so well, it's almost hard to maintain them now. It's like a jungle. We can hardly even get between. <laughs> one thing that we, one, we've been sort of changing our, our breeding habits as we learn more. And it, we're realizing it's, it's better to plant them a little further apart. We were, we were doing like one foot spacing for a while and then, then trying to kill them. And we figured the idea was that it wouldn't be bad because you would have enough room because the tree was going to be gone. But it didn't. But somehow, like, the two trees that you want happen to be right next to each other, and then you can't do anything. So, right. they, so yeah. we're kind of changing our techniques and just even just growing it. I mean, growing a nut into a tree is another. It doesn't matter if there's blight or not. That's not an easy thing to do either. In fact, most people don't. Nature does it really well, right? Nature just overwhelms, you know, a chestnut tree puts out its whatever. It's, you know, thousands of nuts, and as long as, like, 2 or 3% survive, it's going to be... It's going to be fine, and we're you know we're trying to do it on these old fields in the open light, and we have voles, we have turkeys, we have raccoons, we have deer, we have moose, we have bear. All these things have tried we to have eat moose. Oh, well, not here, but in uh, no, 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 <laughs> okay. up in uh, our orchards, more up along Route Two. Okay, you can actually see bear claws on some of the chestnut because they they climb up <laughs> to wow, get the nuts. Wow, to get the nuts. Yeah, so it's. Seems like everything wants to eat and kill our poor chestnut tree. But if it, once it gets to a certain stage, then if it doesn't get blighted, it's you know pretty hardy. It's hard to kill a tree once it gets to a certain stage. 
So, so, so we've been doing that in our orchards and we have, we had for a time almost 30 different orchards. And then the next step was to put them into seed orchards. And the, the idea was the progeny, the children of those were going to be pretty blight resistant. Well, now we know that's there. It's less than half blight resistant. So now we're, now we're doing all sorts of new things. Like we're, we used to keep, <laughs> we, we've been using two sources of resistance for most of our our experimentation. That means the Chinese pollen that gave the original resistance. There's clapper and graves, and these are actually trees. I've seen one of these trees. One of the trees is dead. One of the trees is down in Connecticut, because this is where the first guy who was hired by the Chestnut Foundation used this as Chinese samples. So it was clapper, graves, and we used to keep them separate, but we used to keep the sources of resistance separate, but now we with the genetics that have come out recently, we realize we might as well put them all together uh -huh. as they're calling it spiking the punch. You'll get more, you know, you'll get more Chinese in there. And then there's another thing called Nanking. That's a, that's a, a later source of resistance, which is probably more forest-like. Because even in China, you have sort of forest trees and orchard trees, and we want more forest trees. And we, we think Nanking and Clap I saw I think clapper and graves were more sort of orchard trees. So we're mi mixing Nanking in too. So now we're just throwing it all together and then we can do the genetic testing and see what we actually got, which we... If it would be more um, Chinese. Right, because we need a little more, more Chinese to bring back what we've lost and then <laughs> go forward. So it's kind of one's, yeah, two steps forward, one step backward, whatever. So once that we get the the type of tree that we feel will be right. more blight resistant. It won't be our American chestnut because they're, like you said, gone. What we're actually getting is some kind of hybrid because... Right, but our even our hybrid was, it was, I think, 96% okay. American. Which, 96 and, and you could American. even, uh, one of the f recommendations of the science audit was to go back across three more times and it would be more like 98, 99 that can be done over time. And then there's another thing I got to bring up, which is a big, big controversial topic. Oh, you, let's talk about or, the controversy. Okay. Well, over the one, one gentleman, very persistent gentleman at the, Bill Powell at the University of, uh, it's the College of, I forgot, I'm getting the, the name wrong, Natural Resources at SUNY. He, he's at SUNY okay. in New York. He, he thought, well, why don't we make a transgenic tree? And of course, people get all nervous because it's you know here. So they took a, they took a Chinese. I'm sorry, they took an American embryo, and after ten years of trying and trying to figure out how to do it and blasting this gene into the, they they took a, they took a gene that they use or I don't know if they use, but it it helps in, um, it's like an antifungal gene in wheat. So oh. so they blast that in, and after ten to fifteen years of trying and not being able to get the get the seeds to grow and and or putting the when the gene goes in you don't have a control of where it goes on the chromosome and, and sometimes it was in a you know a too dangerous place and the, the seed would abort whatever got one to work and so now once you get one to work then he can easily clone them so they're actually we have some fairly old of these transgenic trees that look they're more than 99% American, but they have one wheat gene in them. So, and they're, and they're testing out really nicely. So that's, the American chest, this caused a big rift in the organization, as you might imagine. Some people don't want to have any kind of unnatural, you know, or they think of it as unnatural. Basically, you're just sort of super hyper-accelerating what nature does anyway, but, but there was a huge controversy. We thought you know half the members might leave the group and it turns out it's not really true people are willing to try these different approaches so the breeding is what i've been talking about okay the transgenic or bio biotech version that's another approach which is looking very promising i'm, I'm not against it if it works i'm all for it and mm -hmm. then the other thing is biocontrol where there are actually certain things will hold back the blight naturally like their their viruses virus their viruses in the soil that kill the fungus. So if you have if you want to take the time, if you have a you have a canker around your tree that's five feet up, you can mud pack it with saran wrap and keep it wet and that, that canker will go away because the viruses in the soil will kill the blight. But it's just impractical to do for 
a forest. Yeah, I mean, I've tried to do it in my yard too. It's just, oh, you forget, and that you know the the compact isn't wet or something, and all of a sudden you've got the blight anyway. So, those are the three, and we've actually had some success at that natural stand I was telling you about in Wisconsin. We actually sent people out to try to inoculate those trees with the 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 what's called hypovirulence. So it's it's like a super virus that helps kill off the, the blight. So we've been trying, and it, it works a little bit. I mean, it works, it's not 100%, but it certainly helps. We're, so those are sort of our three, it's called the three burr approach. You have <laughs> breeding, biotech, and, um, I think it's wrong. Yeah, bio, and then the bio, yeah, when I'm, um, I'm always, I'm blanking out. You have breeding, biotechnology, and uh, bio, the, the transgenic one. The transgenic yeah, I, one, I, right. I've, 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 I forgot my, my burrs, but those are so the So we will end up bringing back our American chestnuts through a combination of all right. of these. Oh, the great thing and is that the transgenic tree, if that works, you put one out in the forest and it breeds with another wild one, half the progeny have the, have the gene. So you could easily build up a fairly resistant population pretty quickly. Even though there's one wheat gene in that. And yeah, exactly. That's, but again, that can be controversial. And even, well, I mean, we can talk about this later too. Even if we had the perfect tree today, it's like a 500,000 year project to try to get the tree back to where- To get it right. Yeah. So, so there's also thought that, you know, even if we do put transgenic trees out into the forest, keep a very large area where you don't put any in so that that can sort of keep on with the natural. I mean, we're just impatient. Probably eventually yeah. Chestnut might figure out a way of getting over the blight. It just keeps re-sprouting and re-sprouting, but we aren't very patient, so we're trying to accelerate things. That is really fascinating. So you would actually take, there's actually, have we gotten to the stage where we're, there's swatches of forest where we're bringing them in, or are we no, still, we're what we've still done figuring is, that out? What we've done is, uh, in order to get in order to get some people to donate money to the organization, we often like uh, the, the down in the south, especially the the coal mining industry, where they take a place and they kind of strip mine it and ruin it. One thing they realize is, oh, if we if we strip mine it and we don't p compact it too much and we plant trees, it doesn't look so bad. So we've gotten them to actually plant a lot of chestnuts on old strip reclaimed strip mining area, and they've given us money and obviously it makes them look good too but that's so it's but again we didn't really have blight resistant things to give them yet so right. when we get it it there'll be places we can try it but it's just gonna it's gonna take a long time I mean it took 50 years to kill them all off it's gonna take a lot longer hundreds to, to bring yeah, them all exactly. back yes yeah so no, it's especially when we consider how you know it's eight to ten years you have to wait for right every generation I mean even yeah. if they're hyper accelerated four or five years you might be able to get a nut but usually it's much more like 10 years wow so last time on this podcast we spoke with um bob from the north bar trails oh yeah and since then i have found in reading about the trails a little bit folks you can find a sapling chestnut oh yeah they're all over edmund hill woods definitely that's marked on one on the trail of what that is and now you also, we were just talking before we started the show, there is another place in Northborough where you can see chestnut trees, and that's at Watson Park. Yes. Those are, those are trees that were at Tugas Orchard and then were moved there, and they're kind of a mixture. I, first, I was told at first that they were all American, but they're definitely a mixture of different, different trees, and I'm sure Mo Tugas knows exactly what they are. But they're there some look chinese some look very american and they just keep dying and re-sprouting they don't look pretty but they they they've been there for a while now they've been there for like i forget she said 10 15 20 years they've been there for a while he that sounds them. about right. yeah he moved them a while ago because yeah. i always go back and look at them every year i have my certain places where i can go check out trees they're not very big i was just no they're not the summer. big they're um what are they maybe like eight 10 feet yeah, tall? Yeah, they get to, yeah, at most 10 or 15 feet tall, and then they just sort of, the main stem dies back. And uh, that's, you know, that's pretty much what happens in the forest. I mean, almost anywhere 
in Northboro or even in Massachusetts, if you see oak trees and you're walking along, you're probably just missing the chestnut trees because they, they don't grow up too big. Actually, look for the trees that look dead and you'll see the dead stems and then you might see little sprouts coming out of the bottom. Because actually my first, Northboro is uh, important to me because my first chestnut I ever identified in the flesh was over by Bartlett Pond on the other side. My son was two years old. Mm. He's now like 31. And I was driving along and trying to get him to take a nap after school. <laughs> and I'm, I'm driving around. I'm, I was trying to find chestnuts. I had just gotten involved. I'd gotten this old National Geographic article on the original. You know, this is pre-internet where you actually had to do some digging to get information on something. <laughs> and uh, I, I knew what the, the leaf looked like. And I'm driving along. And all of a sudden, I saw it slammed on the brakes. I made sure no one was behind me. Slammed on the brakes and I saw some trees over on the side of the road and those are the first chestnuts I ever actually ever saw, real chestnuts. Mm. Wow. Which was a big moment for me and now it's, I see them all over the place. Mm. But it's funny, I'm so used to looking at low stump sprouts, I'm really bad. Like if there's a big chestnut tree, I hardly look at it because I know that's not where I'm usually looking because mm. they're, usually, they're usually dead. So, well, this is radio, so we've mentioned that you can go to Watson Park, which yep. is right off Lyman Street, right. and you can walk down or drive down that big driveway that leads to the pond. There right. is a trail, by the way, to the left at the entrance of that pond. So right. that's where we'll see our mixture of American and Chinese chestnuts. Um, yeah, the ones by the side of the road. And the ones by the side of yeah. the road. So... That way, folks, you'll know what they look like, and then you can look for them yeah, in at least other be places. On the so they have sort of a matte finish on the leaves, and they're very pointy. Um, yeah, it's a huge, I mean, it's hard to explain, but it's kind of like a canoe shaped off, and it's, this, is, this is one of the biggest leaves I've ever seen in my life. This came off my tree in my yard. This is, my tree is a seven-eighths American, so, but it's kind of a big canoe shape. It's got... Uh, kind of, as you said, flat green, whereas the Chinese is more waxy green on top, you can see here. And yep. if you have a microscope, you can go underneath and look at the leaf hairs. That's another way of telling how Chinese or American they are. And then if you really have a, a dissecting microscope, you go down to 30X and you look at a little part of the leaf and there's, I don't, I've never seen this. I don't know why I haven't bought a microscope, but there's something called the hot cross buns pattern that you see and then you know it's American. Ah. At least that's what I'm told by people who know it there. That sounds like a fun project for uh, Yeah, it'd be a, a good nice, biology. Uh, nice project for a children's program, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, and actually, it, uh, now that you mention it, we have a microscope in our library of things. Yeah, there you so, go. Feel so free. there you go, folks. You can check that out and get a leaf from one of the chestnut trees at Watson Park and see the hot cross buns on the back. Yes. Now, but the fruit is also very interesting. Yeah, the fruit is, again, something most people aren't used to. So it's like a big, spiky ball. There are, and of course, it starts off, as I said, as you know, smaller than your pinky when it's being pollen pollinated mm -hmm. the first time, then over the, you know, by fall. But this is just about time they start falling. So... The Chinese are used to warmer climates, so they're starting to fall a little bit early. Americans will fall in about two weeks, and sometimes it just depends on how many cold nights we have. And all of a sudden, you know, the leaves, they, sorry, the burrs open up, and I'm fighting the squirrels to try to, you know, get a few, a few nuts. <laughs> it's, a, it's always a, and actually one funny story was in my own town of Westboro, there used to be a tree over by the high school. It was a Chinese tree, but I would go there sometimes, I could find lots of nuts, and other times I couldn't find them. That's because someone else in the foundation was also going there and like fighting. Going. We were fighting for, <laughs> over the same tree and didn't even... Each other and the didn't squirrels. Even know it. Yeah, so the burr is a big spiky thing that's very hard to touch. It's very... It's because the tree doesn't want the nuts to be taken before it's they're not until they're ripe. Once they're ripe, the burr opens up to like four leaves. It's kind of three or four leaves it starts splitting and then you get you, you mostly get three nuts if this is actually one from this morning in here ouch wow. and it and i can hurt myself pretty badly trying to get it out but then there you go there we go that's funny this nut looks this doesn't look great this nut looks like it tried to grow too fast and it's got a split in the casing but anyway that might work so that's i gotta remember where that came from that's for, for that one huh? and so there are three burrs. Sometimes you can get four, which is a kind of a, that's like a four-leaf clover. And then you can also see in this, inside the burrs, some, some of the nuts don't get pollinated. So like this one here is, 
There's your little unpollinated nut. So it's very thin. Wow. It's about, sorry. So, so folks, if you're going to pull apart a burr, make sure you have work gloves on because yeah, they, what, they are very spiky. What we chest hunters do is sometimes we put them on the ground and open them with our feet. That's the kind of an easy way if you don't have gloves. And there's an unpollinated nut. But then, again, the, so the life cycle is that nut gets you know, taken by a squirrel and buried two or three inches down. Then the squirrel, unfortunately, dies, forgets, or forgets where forgets, it is yeah. in the spring. Uh, the nut has to go through some cold temperatures. It has to go through like 40 degrees for 30 days or something like that. And then, and it also has its own little, like it has sugars and fats and it has its own antifreeze system that keeps it, keeps it from freezing. And then in the spring, it puts out a little, what's called a radical, it goes down, a little st stem comes up and you've got it like your little mini tree starts growing. Then just this hmm. needs about eight years to, to grow without being eaten by you know, a raccoon or a blue jay or whatever. Or getting or, the blight. Or getting the blight, which happened usually around five or six years. Okay. And then it's, you know, then it would produce, in the old days, it would produce quite a few nuts. Hmm. Wow. So how can we help? How could an ordinary person like myself or is one of our listeners well, help the Chestnut Foundation? Like many volunteer organizations, we have a very small amount of people doing thousands of hours of work. So any kind of, we're, we're trying to get better about agricultural things are difficult because the timing is very difficult. So, you know, you can't say we're going to have a work party the third week in October because it could be the first week, it could be, you know, the next month. Yeah. So we have sort of these immediate needs at very <laughs> emergency needs that happen when we can't really schedule it. So we're trying to get better with social media. We've noticed that we do have a Facebook page. So I think it's called MA slash RI for Mass Rhode Island um, American Chestnut Foundation. And then you can get local information. I think we also have a mailing list. So we, we need people to help mostly what we need is things you don't want to do in your own yard like weeding who wants to go you know who wants to spend the afternoon weeding and someone else's but that's honestly what we need so like weeding for example in the orchard in the orchards you, exactly because they so even though we use tree tubes and we use uh, you know landscape plastic or, or it just weeds just they seem they're impossible and so then they compete so, for the nutrients right exactly so we hand weed like every tree in that orchard twice at least in a season, which just takes, and certain people are amazing. They just go, they just go out and do like two or three hours of weeding every morning for weeks at a time. I'm, I'm not one of them, I have to admit. Okay. I've got my own yard I can hardly keep, keep track of, but it's, uh, and we need membership. We need, you know, it's uh, to join the organization. It's funny, you would think, you'd think an organization like this would have thousands of members, but we have like, under 300 in Massachusetts. Wow. So you, as somehow we're just not getting the, the message out, but uh, sometimes So we, there's an annual fee, even yeah, if you it's don't like, weed, right, even if you yeah, don't no, come it's, and I think it's, sit in it's the bucket. It's <laughs> 35 or $40 a year. Because when you send that to the national organization, we get back like $20, and they take okay. half of it. And then, you know, and they have a very good website. If you go to the acf.org website, it is very good, and you can get to our website from from their website. It's got a lot of good stuff, pictures. It is a great website. I've, I've looked around a lot on that. So that's that's great, though. Like, if people can yeah, no, you can donate get into time it. Yeah, or, so either or donate money. time or get a membership or get a membership for someone you think might be interested. It's uh, And, you know, most of us are very happy to show. If you're really interested, we'll bring you over to an orchard and show you, you know, we're, we like to actually show you the real stuff. That's right. why I brought in... <laughs> I like I like to show the real thing. Right. Well, maybe we can schedule some field trips from the library. That might be a, a nice yeah, program no, that we could do. Yeah, there are thousands of chestnuts over there in Westboro at the Mass Fish and Wildlife. All nice little lines, rows, and uh, of course, then we have to keep track of them all. They're all we all know the pollen parent and the mother and which level of you know breeding it is and what we're going to try to do with the nuts when we get them. But it's. It's, it's, a it's lot of work. exciting. It's a lot of work, though. Someone had to go in there and brush hog the whole thing and clear it off, and then we had to right. get permission, and we had to put up a deer fence, and you know, it's it's not a. S but I would think that this would be a great family volunteer um, opportunity. Yeah. Because you figure, you know, it's like your son is young. If yeah. you go with what your children when they're younger, and then eight right. to ten late years right. later, 
and they're older, they could see what happens in a lifetime of the tree in their own lifetime. Right. I used to bribe my children over at Tower Hill that I would get them ice cream on the way back. <laughs> there you go. That, 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 was, that was usually enough. Or I'd take them to the pool or something afterwards. That was the, uh, that was yeah. the bribe, and they would go help me That's water. That's great water seedlings or whatever. I bet right. the scouts or the Girl Scouts would uh, uh, yeah, we haven't, be willing you know, to help. Some, I know, I'm trying to think of Boy Scouts. We haven't really contacted the Girl Scouts. I think subgroup was using the Boy Scouts, but again, it's hard. Like even for like an Eagle project, it's hard because you can't just set it up and then leave it. It needs right. continuous maintenance, which is, well, it's, that's another issue with Eagle projects anyway. But right. mm. but it's hard with any organization. With kids, the kids grow up, and then what do you do? Well, as long as there's another group that can. We have a, we have a pretty good relationship with a school down in um, uh, South South Coast. It's um, we, have to, well, we have a couple different relationships, but they, it's an agricultural school, Aggie. It's a Norfolk Aggie Wonderful. agricultural okay. school. And uh, we actually have an orchard there, and kids go out, they work, and... You know, even during the summer, we got some kids to who would get paid to like, come and help help with the orchard, and then, then it was like those storms, and we like power oh. lines went down, and like the, all the tubes got blown up, and almost the whole orchard got blown up in one day. Oh, <laughs> so after right. all that work, so it's hard. And then also we've had kids out at Tantasqua, I think, is out in mm -hmm. uh, west of Sturbridge, yep. yeah. where the you know where the tornado came through. Right. Mm -hmm. They're actually trying to plant chestnuts in the holes. That, oh. So they've had some luck with that out there. They've done. That's so there's a teacher, there's a science teacher out there who got interested. So he's got like a whole sort of chestnut club out there. But again, we we need to do that times ten, and mm. there's yeah. just only so much. So human. all you budding field scientists and citizen scientists yes. can, can talk can contact the American Chestnut Foundation. You yep. can do a lot of work right here in our own backyard. Yep, you can do as much as you want. You can just get a membership, or you can get your hands dirty, whatever you want to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Is there anything else, Brad? We want to mention uh, today? It's just, I mean, just so much. Just we, as an organization, in the last two years, we just learned about the sort of three gene approach really needs to be a nine gene approach, <laughs> which is a huge, but also in the last few years, the genetic testing has come down in price and we have some of the equipment actually, our national can do some of that testing. So we can send them a leaf and they can pretty much tell us sort of the amount of Americanness hmm. in, in the tree. And with what our scientist says, who knows all about these things, he said that anything in our orchard that is over 95% American, which is what we were trying for, probably sh we should get rid of because that's not going to have what we want. So we've, in a way, I told you, we're sort of taking a little step back. Yeah. Then we can, then we have better ways of sort of selecting now. And of course, one thing you can do is you can even, you can even take a nut, I'm sorry, you can take a, a leaf and do a, a test on part of the leaf. And sometimes you can get a fairly good blight resistant test on just a, a stem assay. So they just take a little blight and put it right on the stem of the hmm. leaf. And that oh. way, so if you, you could, you know, a seedling gets a leaf pretty quickly, so you could not waste all the time and energy on, the, on that one. You can also do nut, you can also take, you can do a sampling of nuts. So the, if the more testing we can do, the earlier we can be just more careful with the ones we really want. So that's, mm -hmm. select, that's yeah. what we're gonna, that's sort of our new approach now that the whole genetic testing thing is just much easier. And will that be able to speed up that eight to ten year? And timeline? then you can yeah. really speed it up, and you can really put your energy into that tree for like five years. You can get, you know, if you really water them and fertilize them, you can get a nuts in five years. Uh -huh. If you have, uh, you know, hundreds in an orchard and they're struggling, it could be, you know, ten to fifteen years. So, mm -hmm. hopefully that'll that'll speed things up. And the, uh, as I said, just the genetic testing just keeps getting better and cheaper. So, mm -hmm. it's still a little expensive for us to test every tree right. but it's coming way down I think it used to be I don't know I'm this used to be like a hundred dollars per test now it's coming down to like six or seven dollars you know eventually hopefully you know if it were one dollar a test that would really be worth it then we'd only be putting our energy into what we want mm -hmm. right that's fascinating I'm so glad you came in here oh, today mm -hmm. Brad. I've learned a lot I think our listeners have learned a lot certainly yeah we're we're willing to tell the story too, and when we can start meeting again, we can do 
presentations for yes. people. Well, I'll definitely have you come back for okay. a presentation. That was our original plan, and right. then, you know, COVID. Right, so. exactly. <laughs> but, um, yes, we'll do that. Because it'll be great for, our, you know, everyone to see what it looks like as well. Thank you so much, Brad, for coming in yeah, and sharing you. all of this. Um, You're welcome. I learned a lot about the chestnuts and why they're important. And I hope our listeners are just as excited about helping out the foundation as I am today. Yeah. So thanks so much, Brad. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. much for listening to Doc Talks News and Views with Katrina and Deborah. You can email any uh, questions that you might have for Dr. Taco McBeardface at podcast at northboroughlibrary.org. Our website is northboroughlibrary.org and you can give us a phone call at 508 508- Three nine three five zero two five. Anytime for any questions you might have. And of course, come on down and check out that microscope. From oh the, yeah, uh, Library of Things. And we have lots of books and videos and probably audiobooks too on trees. Mm-hmm. We'd love to see you. And we do have a book on the American chestnut if you want to read up on it some more. Awesome. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye.